सो हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम टू यू पी एस सी सी एस सी इन इंग्लिश दिस इज योर फ्रेंड एंड मेंटर सिधि बांगर सो लेट्स बिगिन आई बी डिस्कसिंग इंडिया पाकिस्तान पार्ट टू टूडे वी ऑलरेडी डिस्कस्ड इंडिया पाकिस्तान पार्ट वन बट बिफोर दैट ब्रीफली अबाउट मी सो आई एम सिधि बांगर थ्री ईयर्स ऑफ टीचिंग एक्सपीरियंस अपियर्ड इन यू पी एस सी बोथ मेन्स एंड इंटरव्यूज एंड did my post grad from xlri jamshedpur in hr okay folks so at an academy you get daily live classes you get live test and quizzes and notes in the pdf format all our courses are as per the latest syllabus of the upsc and with one subscription of an academy you get unlimited access to all our live and recorded courses and even the upcoming courses which will be there in the duration of your subscription also to help both the fresher students and the perseverant aspirants or the people who have been given upsc for a while it's the second or third attempt to identify what went wrong and what is the correct uh, approach we have launched the an academy iconic program the reason it is called iconic is it gives you so many benefits it's one of its kind program it's a unique program it will provide you with a personal mentor which a lot of people seek uh, throughout your upsc journey starting from prelims till the interviews happen or till you make your name in the final merit list of upsc so that person will be there to help you study effectively he will help you know more about the exam which optional to choose which to leave out how to study gs and current affairs how to prepare for essays how to write answers when to write answers uh, a study plan and finally help you with the personality development which is required for interviews and also help you fill out the daf detailed application form you might think that it's a normal form but let me tell you having had the experience of the interviews this is a after you fill out the complete daf there is a summary created so that's a one pager and that is the only thing which the interviewers have when they interview you that one page it's like your resume so if you haven't made it correctly the questions that will be asked to you will go haywire so you have to make the daf in the way that you can answer the questions in the best possible manner so as to increase your chances of selection so that's the importance of daf it is hugely hugely important in securing those marks in interview with that so our iconic program and plus program can be compared to these two data plans or uh, uh, cell phone plans by one telecom operator so our plus plan it's a little bit cheaper nonetheless it can meet your basic needs all right however our iconic plan so just with a very very small cost to pay you get a lot of benefits just like in this redex plan you are paying 1000 you are getting netflix you are getting amazon you are getting z5 you are getting 7 days international roaming you are getting lounge access and especially for a person like me i have been a consultant in corporate so lounge access i know how important it is because i used to sleep at the airport literally sleep at the airport so with these kind of offerings this is our iconic program so slightly higher price but nonetheless if you see with 1000 payment you getting benefits worth rupees 20000 so iconic is similar the personal mentorship that is required for upsc is extremely costly but here our prices are extremely reasonable especially for the one year and two year courses so for plus our prices are 44000 which if you use my code sbus it comes down to less than 40000 and for a two year course for the plus subscription if you use my code sbus you again get a 10% off and the cost comes down to less than 58000 for iconic the two year mentorship program actually is for 1 lakh rupees a little shy from 1 lakh rupees comes down to 89000 only if you use my code sbus because you get an instant 10% off that means almost 10000 rupees have been shaved off this entire price and a one year iconic program or one year mentoring program actually comes uh, for a price of or for a program of 57600 after 10% off has been applied using my code sbus with that folks choose wisely if you're already watching this video you've already chosen wisely you have chosen an academy and choose iconic for a better preparation because at iconic we give you personal coach daily means q and a practice study planner and personalized feedback in addition to what you get under the plus subscription so with that folks please use my code sbus to get the iconic subscription
these are my courses which are already running on an academy it's a course on 200 core topics of science and technology so i've covered entire science and technology current affairs between may 19 to may 2020 and this is the ir series which i am taking currently for you so there we go let's start today today we'll be discussing india pakistan relations part 2 and then in the india and its western neighbors part 3 i will be discussing india afghanistan relations folks i'll just do a quick review of pakistan where we left Uh, on uh, 22nd of uh, sorry 20th of july so i will cover that i had discussed the importance of pakistan i had discussed its entire geography and the ethnic minorities or the religious groups that are there then we discussed india pakistan relations history all right now in the history i had covered till the kargil war i had discussed the junagadh issue of 1947 the kashmir issue of 1948 the 1965 war 1971 liberation war i had already discussed when i discussed indo bangladesh so you can go and look at those lectures i have discussed that in detail 1990 kargil war 1999 kargil war also i have discussed in detail now what remains to be discussed is actually this part we left when we finally left on 20th july the same session at 8:30 pm we left it here we left at with saluting our heroes of the kargil war now we'll move today towards some in between things that we have left the diplomatic relations that we had forged in between the agreements that we have signed with pakistan and what has happened since 1999 between india and pakistan in a very brief manner and then we'll come on to the issues of concern that are there between india and pakistan the issues of concern the issues of cooperation and some issues i am not covering here some issues i will be covering for example the india pakistan america axis i will be covering when i discuss the india and americas and the uh, india afghanistan pakistan axis or india uh, pakistan india afghanistan relations hampering pakistan's uh, 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 trust on us that i will be discussing in my next series when i'll be discussing india afghanistan uh, lecture with that folks this is the joke this uh, was in line with when we had uh, switched off our last session that is the kargil wars so uh, obviously even after the 2611 trials pak court had granted bail to lakhvi and so these two cartoons are there just to pay homage to our soldiers folks let's start for today so first let's start with the diplomatic dealings i will come to these cartoons later why india and pakistan are the way they are so we'll come to these cartoons a little later now folks uh, a very good evening to you all i will okay first folks what happened now just keep listen just relax and keep listening all right so in 1990 1988 right now in 1988 both the countries signed an agreement we left it 1999 so let's move 10 years ahead of it what happened why we actually reached to 1999 kargil war that was the last war so 1998 uh, 88 the countries had already an agreement that neither side will attack the others nuclear installations or facilities yes now that was because in 1974 we had already done the smiling buddha pokran te po uh, test and pakistan had also declared that they have also become a nuke powered country and that's where actually china comes in because it was not without the support of china that pakistan could become a nuclear country and there will be some very very serious revelations when i'll be talking about pakistan space technology program and you'll see how far china is entrenched into pakistan since then onwards the two country decided that the biggest confidence measure will be that whatever nuclear installations they will have they will share information of the exact location of the nuclear installations so that there is a confidence building no side would doubt the other one otherwise there was a serious threat to our peace and harmony because if there is a distrust both nations will run forward to get nuclear power and might attack each other however it was done then and in fact it has been followed since then whatever peaceful facilities that we have we share the latitudes and longitudes or the locations of those things with pakistani people or with the pakistani government then came 1989 now as you must be aware it was a time when the kashmiri pandits actually left the kashmir valley in hordes there was a lot of exodus of people from the kashmir valley why 
because the insurgency was on its rise. So the Mujahideen, which were prepared by Pakistan to fight against the Soviets in Afghanistan, we have already discussed it in the first lecture. They were actually harbored by the US to counter Soviets' growing presence near the Central Asian countries. So these Mujahideens who were inbred in Pakistan, they were now sent to Kashmir to create nuisance, which they actually did back in 1965 also, which they tried to do in 1999 also. So these same people, they had come inside and they were creating a lot of violence and nuisance, which they still do in the valley. If you see the stone pelting, if you see the Shopia case, even recently after the uh, revocation of Article 370, so all the disturbances are actually caused by these people. So this was for the first time that they actually came in and we recognized that insurgency was happening in uh, Kashmir. And it was a very, very bad time for Kashmir. In fact, if you really want to recall it, if you really want to understand it well, I would suggest that you go and watch the movie Heather. It actually reflects the Kashmir of 1990s. In fact, I had the opportunity to go to Kashmir back in 1994. So that time, the insurgency was at its peak. And in fact, we had somehow, we just went to Punjab. And from there, my parents decided that why not visit Kashmir? That was our first Kashmir visit. So we were greeted by the army and they were like, have you come here to die? Because the situation was so bad in Kashmir. And they were like, look, you people are government officials. My father being a government servant, they were like, you people have to seriously go back from here. Both my parents are government servants. Otherwise, you have the risk of getting killed. So those people, the army men, they didn't leave us for a single second. They escorted us back safely from the borders of Jammu and Kashmir. And when they only sent us out from Kashmir, they, they escorted us till Jammu. Then they left us at Jammu. That's it. Now you're safe. Now you can go back. But Kashmir, you do not belong here, at least in 1994. That is not the Kashmir you would want to see. With that, 1992, we again had a declaration. So both the countries filed a joint declaration prohibiting the use of chemical weapons. Can you see the extent of distrust each country has on each other? That you need to be signing such kind of agreements regarding chemical weapons or nuclear weapons so early, so back in the 1980s and 1990s when these things weren't really on the global map. So that's the extent of the dispute we have been having. Uh, I'm sorry, Rajput boy, but that's not known even to no normal people. That's only told to the prime minister and the president who are in the command of the armed forces. Only these people have idea about the nuclear installations that we have, if you're talking about the defense. The rest, the nuclear powers, etc. That you can obviously Google. One is in Tamil Nadu, which re recently uh, went online. Right? So that's already there. The rest one you can find on uh, the internet. The one in Kota. It's there. But for the defense installations, nobody knows. Nobody will ever know because that's a very, very sensitive information. All right? Okay. Uh, it's not related to religion, uh, Rajput, or whatever your name is. I won't take your name because it's very cumbersome. So it is true that it's not related to religion. That was the time when the 1987 uh, 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 Legislative Assembly elections happened in Kashmir. And as per the uh, people there, the Kashmiri people there, they believed that the elections had been rigged by the Indian government. So obviously the Hindus had to move out and we cannot i cannot be here plain speaking about in the chagai hills in pakistan and they also declared themselves a nuclear nation post which both nations were facing economic sanctions india was more prepared to face those economic sanctions than pakistan however pakistan being the favorite of both us and china was definitely going to benefit from them sooner or later any which ways 1999 came. Now look at the turn of events here. Repeatedly, repeatedly, India has tried to extend the hand of friendship. So just now, just looking at us, they declared that they have also had nuclear test. We weren't on very good terms, even in 1996. So after 1994, we again visited Kashmir in 1996. That was the first time when I... Next come 2001. So 1999 hadn't even passed, 2000 was a year of Y2K problem, 2001 the Kashmir Legislative Assembly gets attacked and almost 40 people are killed. Again the relations go, take a nosedive. Still Atal Bihari Vajpayee once again and at that point of time Musharraf had become the president. 
from Nawaz Sharif. So, Nawaz Sharif was the Prime Minister during the Kargil War and post which Musharraf had taken up. So, Parvez Musharraf was now the President. So, we decided once again to engage with the Pakistani polity. And Agra summit happened where we decided that we will go ahead with the Lahore Declaration. We will go ahead with the Simla Accord and we will try not to unilaterally change our boundaries. Fine. But again, 2001, attack on the parliament. I still remember that newspaper heading that was there, that Asmat pe hamla, India ki izzat pe hamla. So our self-respect, our respect was harmed when you attack an institution, which is the symbol of democracy, which is the symbol of independent India. They attacked parliament. And since then, of course, the security at parliament has go gone up by leaps and bounds. So then happened the armed attack on India just following the attack on the Kashmir Legislative Assembly. So again, we've extended hand of friendship. They said, yes, yes, we will come in. And then again, they backstab us. Again, for three years, nothing happened. We were so disturbed by that entire thing. And even there was pressure because that time, if you remember, the UP government had just come in. So there was a lot of pressure that, you know, we want even the NDA government was a coalition government and the UP government that came was also a coalition government. So all the coalition part partners had a lot of pressure on the government that this time we will not go first. Let Pakistan come first. Let them do something about terrorism. And it is only then we will talk to them. So the Pakistani prime minister then he went to UN and he spoke about what has happened. And they said we'll try to control it and extended a hand of hand of friendship. So in 2004, Manmohan Singh got a line and they started the composite dialogue process after the SARC summit meeting that happened in 2004. Fine. 2006, things were still going good. India and Pakistan decide to put in place an anti-terror mechanism. Now, that was a big step forward. You are institutionalizing anti-terror mechanism. That means Pakistan was for the first time with us to fight terrorism together with India. Now, we again had some trust built into them. And then comes 2007, Bombing of Samjota Express. Again, more than 50 people die in that and the scars that were left were very, very deep. That happened. India again said, we will not talk. And these perpetrators of the attack, they need to be brought to book. However, in 2008, looking at that we required resources from Turkmenistan, the Turkmenistan India finally, so originally, the TAPI framework or the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline, it was originally between Turkmenistan, Afghanistan and Pakistan only. India later joined it. When India, it was the time of global crisis, but India was growing rapidly, so we required more resources. So we decided to join this pipeline as a measure of friendship also and as a measure of extending our resources till the Central Asian countries. So we decided to join the TAPI framework it's a $7.6 billion gas pipeline project about which I'll discuss later in detail. So hold on with that. Any doubts so far? Uh, whatever your name is, Rajput boy or whatever your name is, see, I'll discuss everything. So just wait, hold, just keep listening. I will discuss each and everything. I will not leave out anything. Let the lecture complete. Even after that, if you feel that I've left out something, then point it out. All right. Okay, chal. 2008 happens. So we had just entered the TAPI framework 2007, 2008. The very first news that you hear is that Kabul Indian embassy has been attacked. And of course, people died. Then 2007 was also the time Benazir Bhutto was assassinated. So her husband, Asif Ali Zardari, he became the president. That time, Asif Ali Zardari, he came to India and Manmohan Singh, they both decided to open the trade routes. However, it would be limited just to 21 items of trade. Any which ways. Again, we had just opened the trade routes. 2008, 26-11 attacks on Taj and the rest of the Mumbai happened. That was shell-shocking for India. You attacked our financial capital. Taj was held hostage for almost three days. And we had nowhere to go. We had simply no idea. We lost so many lives that time. And not just Indians, but also foreigners. So that may, that put India on high alert around the world that India is not a safe country to be. That means we couldn't even protect the heart of India. We couldn't even protect the finance capital. That showed a lot of 
lag in our intelligence capability in fact it was that time that the gujral doctrine was heavily criticized for completely unraveling india completely destroying india's intelligence because we wanted to believe in the procedure of recipro non reciprocity or we were too benign with our neighbors we were not alert so that point of time the gujral doctrine was highly criticized and then that's when we started building our intelligence again started our defense imports again started fortifying our ocean region again and that's why now when you see so many submarines and so many ships being commissioned it's because of those 2611 attacks which happened through the sea route 2012 justice is finally done ajmal kasab was executed 2014 prime minister modi swears in and at that point of time pakistan releases 151 fishermen as a goodwill gesture in fact that was also the time prime minister had invited all the sark leaders to his swearing in ceremony underlying the neighborhood first policy in fact modi was so positive about it he wanted to carry forward the legacy of atal bihari vajpayee ji of manmohan singh so he decided to drop by in lahore on sharif's birthday nawaz sharif's birthday he also took a sari for sharif's mother it was sharif's granddaughter's marriage so he went there and just after that in 2016 we woke up to attacks in the uri base and again 19 and 20 soldiers were killed there in uri that time we decided the modi government was already very decisive about what had been happening in the past 10 years so they being in the opposition had been always telling upa to give a fitting reply to pakistan for what all what it had done and to actually score against what they had done with our people the amount of human loss the amount of social loss that we had incurred because of pakistan so this i we decided to teach them a lesson i'm sure you all must have already watched that movie odi the surgical strikes so that point of time the modi government they went all ahead and had the surgical strikes uh, right after 10 to 15 days of the odi attack anyways two years again passed things keep dilly dallying nothing really moves forward in the india pakistan relationship 2019 14th february the pulwama attack a suicide bomber overtakes the crpf van and all the crpf personnel are killed right after that we were completely exhausted with pakistan this time we were like we are done but this thing really can't go on now this this is something which is just uh abhorrible it's it's completely despicable it's it's should be just you know cut off completely this nation needs to be cut off completely so that was the time when we not only decided to attack back so we had the balakot air force attack but immediately we revoked the most favored station uh, most favored nation status of pakistan so you will be surprised to know india has been revoking and giving back the most favored nation status to pakistan however this time we have revoked it we haven't yet uh, set it up back pakistan never gave us the most favored nation status what happens under the most favored nation status you are treated at par with your other export or import trading partners and at this point of time we hiked up the duties to 200% on items from pakistan just to show them what we can do by trade apart from attacking them physically we also attacked them economically and it was time about the modi government having a very very strong mandate coming for coming in for a second time 2019 decided to revoke article 370 and as soon as we revoke article 370 in august pakistan suspended all bilateral ties with india now it doesn't know that it needs india more than india needs it we highly matlab we hardly actually export anything to it or import anything from it because it hasn't given us the most favored nation status but there is so much that it needs from india cement basic infrastructure materials chemicals plastics etc 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 that it needs from india that it that can be easily available from india but it lost out to all the bilateral trade that we were having however some sense came back in and the kartarpur corridor corridor project wasn't completely cancelled so kartarpur corridor project was actually signed so it was conceived a lot earlier since the time of indian independence i'll discuss the kartarpur corridor in detail but in 2019 they finally let go of it by 20, the 2018 the work started at the pakistani end the construction was completed by 2019 and finally on 9th november 2019 the kartarpur corridor was opened for the pilgrims 
in fact imran khan also said that at least on the sorry not 9th november 12th november uh, 2019 it was opened in fact uh, imran khan also said that on the day of 12th uh, 12th of november when this entire thing was being inaugurated whatever pilgrims will be coming in they won't be charged anything and for one year all the pilgrims have been given a visa free access to the kartarpur sahib and 2020 we are still no attacks have been heard though our situation at the border is not very good as of now but there is something that india and pakistan have been cooperating no talks or talks is on locust attacks so we have a joint office at the india pakistan border in rajasthan which cooperates on the locust attacks locust warning systems so they really work a lot in cooperation so that's one sign of cooperation where we work together because food security is common to all so that's about it now if there is anything then let me know uh it's not an attack by pak actually raj uh, whatever your name is it's actually an attack by the talibani people it was an attack by osama bin laden as it was proved and later they actually hunted him out and killed him in abbottabad so it was an attack but the militants are actually the same they are nothing different the militants who were earlier harbored by pakistan they went on to afghanistan and from afghanistan they keep on crossing the pakistan border and now they keep spreading ter the terrorism everywhere be it pakistan be it india be it usa they are everywhere in fact it is also considered that the isis and the taliban were one and the same entity they are recruiting from one another only so now it's kind of become a global organization of terrorism with that let's come to first the kartarpur corridor all right so kartarpur corridor actually connects the darbar sahib gurudwara that's in uh, okay before i start i'll just give you a brief history so all of you must be knowing that the red cliff line actually divides pakistan with india on the western border so as per that red cliff line one tehseel the shakkargarh tehseel that actually went to pakistan it had the kartarpur gurudwara or the kartarpur region went to pakistan and the dera baba nan uh, baba nanak shrine in gurdaspur district or the gurdaspur district uh, that actually went to india during the partition along the red cliff line now originally india had a plan during the time of indira gandhi that we'll actually exchange or we'll have a land swap agreement with pakistan and we'll take that kartarpur corridor inside india and in lieu of that maybe we can give some land to pakistan however that didn't materialize and then indira gandhi was assassinated so this kartarpur gurudwara is actually just 4 kilometers from the indo pak border so earlier and it's actually on the crossing of the ravi river so earlier people used to cross that bridge on the ravi river and directly go to the kartarpur uh, gurudwara it's a sick uh, place of pilgrimage however post the 1965 war in the 1965 war that bridge was completely destroyed and obviously the border security was heightened a lot so now it's not very easy to actually cross india pakistan border so now you have to take a visa you need to have a passport to actually go there and in fact till now you couldn't even directly travel across the border from uh, gurdaspur to the narowal district in pakistan you couldn't travel directly in a car or by foot because it's very very close so you had uh, the pilgrims from india had to first go to lahore and then again travel around 125 km to go to the shrine in kartarpur so this was done to ease the uh, to and fro movement of the sikh pilgrims from pakistan to india and from india to pakistan in fact you'll be surprised to know that there is a elevated platform which has been built in dera baba nanak shrine in gurdaspur so if you stand on that platform you can directly see the kartarpur sahib it's that close all right then so right now the situation is that uh, pilgrims can visit uh, 5000 and uh, the pilgrims can visit kartarpur sahib on a daily basis they will be required to pay a charge of 20 dollars that's the service fee and it's a visa free travel so pakistan also assured us that indians need not get a passport but india said no for our own security reasons we will get a passport and indians should travel there only with a valid passport from india why because on passports your entire travel history is recorded 
so that we don't want any ill friends coming from pakistan so for our national security it would have made it easier for the people to travel but for a sense of a national security we decided that we will go ahead with having the passport for each visitor however they can go for a visa fee travel now why did they hurry up so much to actually made this corridor that was this was to commemorate the 550th birth anniversary celebrations of guru nanak dev and why is kartarpur sahib very important because guru nanak dev actually spent close to 20 years of his life at the kartarpur sahib in fact uh, there is an interesting thing i had discussed in the yesterday or i think day before yesterday morning's prelim test series uh, uh, um, series that there were almost nine countries all around in the indian neighborhood up till iran and saudi arabia that guru nanak sahib had visited during his lifetime so that's an important question regarding culture so please go and have a look at that okay guys this is how the entire kartarpur corridor looks like so this bridge has been actually restored or this corridor has been restored it's approximately 2 kilometers in length now and it crosses the ravi river so where is the kartarpur thing located it's located on the banks of ravi river this is the indo pak border this is gurdaspur here this is dera ba baba nanak and this is kartarpur uh, gurudwara in fact you'll be surprised to know till 2003 kartarpur was actually used as a stable for cows or a cow shed it was not a proper gurudwara there was no upkeep no maintenance it's only in 2004 the repair works were started by the pakistani government and then finally some sense came into them that they actually make it a made it a proper site of self, uh, uh, sikh pilgrimage they actually completely restored the site uh, only after 2003 till then it was actually closed from 1947 to 2000 it was completely closed it wasn't really working as a proper gurudwara till then okay uh sadhar you don't get this pdf because i have made this lecture so can you please right now focus on the video that will help okay our next issue for today is the water dispute between india and pakistan so this is a very famous one actually do you guys remember there was a statement in 2014 when modi had just sworn in so it was by the army chief of pakistan that kashmir is the jugular vein of pakistan so it's a take on that the indus water treaty so let's discuss the indus water treaty a little bit more in detail because post the pulwama attacks and everything when happened we have decided to actually use the entire water that as of now flows into pakistan to be used for india sorry uh, no mohit i don't actually think so because uh, see cultural ties can help to a extent but given the stubbornness of pakistan that's my personal opinion completely here given the given the stubbornness it's like china and their designs their intentions are very monstrous and even if the designs of the local people are not monstrous the country has been uh, being ruled by the military junta for a very very long while and they are extremely aggressive people they don't work on any part of development they just want kashmir for no reason and then they have their own home grown terrorists so it's actually very difficult to deal with them only through soft power that i'll discuss in detail when i discuss the way forward that what is the way to deal with kashmir i hope this answers your query at least for right now all right okay let's come to the water dispute so what happened so let's see what is the water dispute about what is the indus water treaty about can any everybody see this map um, uh, uh, properly i think it's uh, wide and clear so basically as per the indus water treaty <coughs> the rivers marked in orange that is bias satluj and ravi the three rivers marked in orange they actually came to india india can completely utilize the water of these eastern rivers of the indus river basin however the indus river the jhelum river and the chenab river they completely went to pakistan or the unrestricted supply of water from these rivers completely went to pakistan now in addition to the eastern rivers that we can utilize for ourselves that is ravi bias and satluj or rbs we also have access to the waters that are here for indus or jhelum or chenab all right but 
we can only use them for non consumptive use like having power plants or hydroelectric uh, electricity or similar things but we can't use it for irrigation or likes of that okay so as per this treaty actually the entire water distribution was 80% to 20% in fact to be precise 16% to 84% so 84% of the water actually went to pakistan and 16% of water came to india and this treaty was signed in 1960 between jawaharlal nehru and ayub khan now interestingly actually international treaties should always be signed by the head of the state so they should ideally have been signed by the president and that's why sometimes india you can hear it in the media that india says we'll abrogate the treaty because any which way is it's not valid jawaharlal nehru was a prime minister it was supposed to be signed by the president there so that's how it is now let's come back to the treaty i have already explained you what uh, what part of rivers goes to which indus chenab jhelum go to pakistan ravi bias satluj come to india now apart from the distribution there is also a permanent indus commission that has been set up by the united nations so there is a permanent indus commission which actually takes care of the water dispute between india and pakistan interestingly you will also know that this is one major area of cooperation which is actually converting into an area of dispute now why because indo uh, so this indus water treaty of 1960 is actually uh, a benchmark in the way nations should actually share water in fact it has been told uh, to a lot of asian other asian countries or countries in the western uh, hemisphere that are fighting over water that they should look at how india and pakistan have amicably maintained the indus water treaty now thanks to india for that because we have never tried to transgress on their property and they have also never tried to do that but there are some chinks there which i will point out how india uh, how pakistan and china are also getting into this kind of thing so when the dams are being made china because the origin of indus actually happens in china so china has some made some dams on indus and that is actually and the uh, 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 park uh, park occupied territory because uh, pakistan has already given some land to china which we will see when they sign their boundary agreement now when they have the tarbela uh, the dam name is tarbela and there are some other dams also so because of that dam india being a lower riparian state the water supply that comes to that region is impacted and obviously it's a disputed land you can't cannot make a dam there but pakistan didn't say a word ideally china should have consulted pakistan and india but china consulted none and pakistan didn't say a word because it was receiving aid so that is the way china is actually trying to occupy territory grab territory or use anything any other resources of any other nation to its own advantage and we india and pakistan both are losing to china because we are fighting amongst ourselves now so coming here let's talk about the dispute part so in 2016 Pakistan approached the World Bank so we were trying to make the Kishan Ganga project then Kishan Ganga is a tributary of Jhelum all right i will show you where all these are so this is the riverine map or the indus basin for you jhelum is here all right indus here tochi gomal kandhar zob they are all major tributaries kabul is a major tributary kurram is a major tributary of indus all right then this is chenab ravi satluj and bias is here as you can see in the jhelum river which is here the kishan ganga actually joins in so kishan ganga is actually a tributary of the jhelum river so coming back here now so kishan ganga project we were building on the jhelum river and the ratle project we were building on the chenab river now these both actually both these rivers actually have gone to pakistan under the indus water treaty so they had a problem they approached world bank they said no india shouldn't do it it will affect us in, uh, adversely now india said no it's just a normal technical glitch we can sit together and sort it but they were like no no we just don't want you to make anything however the world bank upon seeing the complete situation gave india go ahead that you should go ahead and make the kishan ganga water project or hydroelectric project now the tulbul project again the tulbul project is near the lake wooler so it is again on the jhelum river this project 
it had been put to halt in 1987 itself after Pakistan objected to it. And now as the conditions have changed when the bilateral ties are completely on a low and uh, we actually want to utilize water for our own benefit, we are actually restarted all these hydroelectric projects as I will tell you going further. Okay. All right. Now, let's come here. The last part of this. So, why is this treaty in news? This treaty is in news because after the Uri attack happened, so usually, I have already told you, there's a permanent Indus commission in the uh, United Nations. So, India unilaterally suspended the regular meetings of the Indus commissioners after the Uri attack. It said, we just don't want to engage. There was a famous slogan by a prime minister said that blood and water cannot flow together. On one hand, you are attacking our soldiers and there's a blood flow. On the other end, you want water or lifeline to flow to, towards you. It cannot happen together. So that's when we decided not to engage with Pakistan uh, at any level. And now it's the time to show Pakistan that we have yet not ever hurt Pakistan or yet have never used our diplomatic points against it but this time we are going to do it. So this time we decided to utilize more of our Indus waters in order to hurt Pakistan's interest. In fact Indus is the lifeline of a lot of cultural and financial sectors because all of them are actually centered around the Indus river. You all know Indus Valley civilization was there because of the Indus river. It's a, almost a similar case. In fact, wherever there are rivers, there is a civilization, there is more growth. Now, what is actually India's share? So, India's share is close to 210 million acre feet. Of that, India only utilizes somewhere around 31 million acre feet, which is close to 15%. And even of that, almost 7.5 uh, million acre feet actually goes unutilized and flows to Pakistan, at least especially from the Ravi and the Satluj rivers. So this time India said, as of now, we had, we were letting all this water go run freely to you. But now, for all these eastern rivers, Ravi, Satlos, Bias, Bias, we will completely use the entire water of the eastern rivers for India only. We will transfer the water to Punjab and Haryana and Rajasthan. We really don't care about Pakistan now. And for the others, it said, so, what are the projects that government is undertaking to actually fully utilize the eastern rivers? So, it's the Uj project. Uj is a river in JNK. It's a, a tributary of the Ravi River. Alright, so the Uj project in JNK is regarding the utilization of the eastern rivers. The Ravi Bias link in Punjab, again, is a second project under this. And the Shahapur Kandi project in Gurdaspur, Punjab is again on the Ravi River. So, we will completely utilize the Ravi and the Bias waters. Now, we are already utilizing the Satluj waters. We have the Bhakran Angal Dam there. And then, we are also trying to utilize the tributary of Chinab. So, we will also go ahead with the Barsar Hyodro Electric Project on the Maru Sudar River, which is a tributary of Chinab. You did not remember that, but you can remember these three projects, three or four projects. There is another one on Chinab, which is the Saval Court Project. I will just show you all these projects on map. So, these three or four projects, we are trying by these three or four projects, in fact, work has already begun on them. The approvals are being given at a fast pace so that work can begin and we can completely shift the flowing of the waters. Once, see, Indus is made up of these rivers only. If you completely shift the water of the tributaries to India, then you can imagine the flow of Indus will, re will reduce to a nala only or a drain only. So how will you actually Pakistan utilize and without water, there is nothing. So these are the hydropower projects. So the red ones here are already completed, the dark ones the work has started and the light blue ones are the names of the rivers. Alright, so Indus is here, Chhelam is here, I will use a different pen so that you can see properly. Chhelam is here, Chinab is here and Ravi is here. So can you see the Bursar project on the Chhelam river, the one I talked about, then the Kishan Ganga here, Tulbul also, both on Chhelam. Bagli Ghar, Jhelam, the, sorry, this is Chenab, the Ratli project, again Chenab, and Dula Hasti, again Chenab, and Ravi, 
The projects are not shown here, but these are the new ones. So the link projects are not shown here, but they will soon be here. I couldn't find another map of it. If you do find another map of it, please go and look for these things. Okay. With that, folks, now we'll start with the third problem. Apart from the water dispute, apart from the Kartarpur corridor, what is there? So it's China's closeness to Pakistan. Can you see this? This is a cartoon when the Gwadar port was taken by Singapore and given to China. Can you see these cartoons? This is the cartoon when India wanted to fight against the Pulwama attack, but saw that China and Pakistan have come together and they are fighting the war against India together. This is again similar thing. We are not able to discuss the terrorism issue with China because we cannot talk about Mazhur, uh, Masood Azhar or NSG. China blocks our membership to NSG, citing that Pakistan, uh, uh, Pakistan should also be into the NSG or nuclear supplier group. Why? Because similar to India, Pakistan has also not signed a uh, uh, non-proliferation uh, treaty. And just like India, it has also been a very peaceful nation. It has never used its nuclear power. So if India gets it, Pakistan should also get it. And by that, it actually blocked our entry into NSG. This thing also I have discussed multiple times. I have discussed it during the India-China diplomacy, India-China relations uh, videos. I have discussed it in the Indian policy, foreign policy videos. I have also discussed it in my defense technology videos, which are there in the science and technology course on Unacademy. So thrice I have already discussed the entire NSG and the other three export control regimes, Australia Group, Vasinar Arrangement, and the MTCR regime, all I have discussed there. Please go and look at it. They are important regimes because China is not part. So there are four regimes in the world, the Vasinar, the Australia Group, the MTCR, and the NSG. China is not part of three of them. It is only a part of NSG and India is a part of three of them. That shows our very, very strong credentials in the uh, uh, domain of nuclear power. And the fourth one is regarding whenever we, Naraz Sharif or Ch India wants to come together, this is the Chinese hand. They actually pick up Pakistan and they take it back. So let's discuss it. So India, uh, I think AKI already discussed that, what India got in the water dispute. I already discussed that. Thank you, Sri Hari. That really helps. Okay. Now, this is the second part or the first part of the Pakistan-China axis. It's basically the history. Folks, there is a video link that I have put here, the YouTube link. It is a link of the RSTV, the big picture show, which actually discusses the uh, sorry, it should be China-Pakistan relations. I'm extremely sorry. Which discusses the China-Pakistan relationships in, uh, in detail or the Pakistan-China axis in detail. So I'll share with you guys this link. Now, you will be surprised to know that sorry, a glimpse of info about railway line in Iran from Chaba to Afghan. Is there any Yes, there is. There is, of course. So earlier we see the idea, the intention for us is we can't have the Gwadar port. We don't have friendly relations with Pakistan. So we and Pakistan, as I have told when I was discussing the first lecture, Samit, since you have regularly attended my lectures, I discussed in the first lecture, Pakistan is our gateway to the Central Asia. Now, if we cannot access Pakistan, what other nation was friendly to us, Iran or Afghanistan? So that's why we wanted to take that railway line through there. But as you will see, I will be discussing the TAPI and the IPI pipeline today. You will see what stupidity India has been doing continuously because of the international pressure that we actually lost the Chabar port and the, and the railway line also both to China. See, whoever has more money and can put it in time, at least in the sanctioned countries, they will have the last say. And I will discuss it why it is important because it's actually, in fact, I already discussed it. Sami, you should go and watch the India-China relations when I was talking about why China is doing what it is doing because there is a modest operandi behind all this thing what is happening be it Myanmar be it Bangladesh be it Nepal be it Bhutan be it Pakistan any time any nation or be it North Korea also the modest operandi of China is to identify which nation in the world is being sidelined right then to go to that nation tell him that don't worry, we are with you because they Chinese don't fear anybody. They are the economic capital of the world. 
so don't worry we are there with you we give you the money to develop if everybody else has put sanctions on you and you cannot receive any money not a problem take money from us we will there help you and that by giving them money by giving them loans it actually makes those country fall in a debt trap and when you are in a debt trap then china goes and occupies their territory so not only it keeps you under its thumb all the time but it expands its infrastructure footprint it keeps on scaring the other nations because it already has a footprint there and the nations who are indebted to it they have to toe the chinese line that has happened in all the countries if you look at all the videos i've touched upon it in a great great detail so that was the reason myanmar when the chinese premier recently visited myanmar in 2020 myanmaris refused that their 7 billion dollar uh, dam project they said if you really want to give us aid we will take you know, aid no more than 1 billion dollar and then you can do the dam project but not more than that we will not go ahead with that because they saw what happened in sri lanka under the debt trap the chinese completely took away the humban tota port so they don't want anything of that sort i hope that answers it yes okay chal <laughs> let's come back to this now what you will be surprised to know is that china and pakistan both have been supporting each other greatly this is not something which has happened overnight so in fact the relations began in 1950 now as you recall earlier pa china was in two parts people's republic of china and the republic of china which was in taiwan right the chang uh, chang kai shek government chang kai shek government now when the communists took over in 1949 but at that point of time there was a cold war era soviet union was equally powerful us was equally powerful so nobody really wanted to recognize a communist nation pakistan was amongst the first nations to actually identify or recognize china and also to support china's permanent seat in the united nations security council so the diplomatic relations between china and pakistan go as far back to as 1950 so india was also very friendly to china at that point of time because we also had soviet leanings but then the 1962 war happened and everything changed the second reason why china and pakistan work but china and india don't is we are a huge power china for china pakistan is a vassal state you give money you maintain your army and you use them the way you want they can't do the same thing with india so india is a competitor pakistan is a subordinate that's how they actually treat this entire relationship now let's come back so that point of time they formed a diplomatic association and since then the people's republic of china has been providing economic military technical assistance to pakistan china refused to help india for the new power but it went ahead and ran towards pakistan and helped it now so the diplomatic relations were established in 1950 they also had boundary issues which were resolved now amazingly boundary issues between china and pakistan were resolved in fact china gained 52 square kilometers of territory more as grazing land from china in 1963 i will also show you that map and the military assistance began in 1966 just after the indo pakistan war of 1965 can you see the links here and the strategic alliance was formed in 1972 again after the 1971 war 1972 when we had just they had just lost us to the uh, lost uh, lost us in the india bangladesh war or sorry the pakistan bangladesh war and we had signed the simla agreement that was the time when they formed the strategic alliance so military alliance right in 1966 after the 1965 war strategic alliance right after the bangladeshi war 1972 all right and the boundary issue right before the sorry right after the india china war so after 1962 they resolved their boundary issues after the uh, indo pak war they resolved their military assistant thing and after the bangladeshi war they resolved their strategic assistant thing and once china began to open in 1979 they started their economic cooperation too so can you see the depth of entrenchment of the relationship we just can't even compare we can't even compare even though we have a strong cultural relationship with pakistan pakistan is our own brother it's a part of our own subcontinent it's a part it was a part of india we still not that close we still not that entrenched but look at the entrenchment an entire nation of india separates pakistan and china but look at the engagement levels they have now amazingly when 
the prc had or the people's republic of china had the tiananmen square protest right so the cultural revolution was going on and then the tiananmen square protest happened pakistan apart from cuba was the only country which supported china at that point of time china was neglected so can you see the modus operandi of these two as it is always said birds of same feather flock together so pakistan's modus operandi is almost similar as china's it saw that china is being sanctioned so it's it's like uh, you know in the class when it happens one person is isolated the rest of the class doesn't talk to it and the other person is also isolated so these people kind of become friends and then they try to isolate the rest of the world because each people understands the pain that the other one had to go through so similar thing happened with china and pakistan and now they have very close military relations political relations defense relations technical relations right in fact when i talk about the space program you'll be amazed with the relationship that china and pakistan had been having for a very very long time now this is the boundary agreement this is the sino uh, park boundary agreement that was signed okay yes samir you're right we'll actually discuss that in detail when i'll discuss the way forward part so don't worry i'll discuss that okay let's come to sino park boundary agreement of march 1963 so can you see it just happened after the indo china war now this was this is the area actually it's called sakshgam valley sakshgam valley this valley was actually given by pakistan to china now when did actually pakistan occupy this entire thing Pakistan occupied this entire thing in I think it was 1960 sorry 1947 yes when our army had reached but it was winters had come so they had this POK with them or the park occupied kashmir so this area was also with pakistan i'll just show you one more time here with a black pen so this area on the map this has been given or ceded by pakistan to china this small bit of land it's called the shaksgam valley now this is a disputed area because it is claimed by both india and pakistan and it has been given to china so this is the issue that they resolved in 1963 let's come to the second part of the pakistan china axis now pakistan also served as China's main bridge to the Islamic world why is China so close to Pakistan so Pakistan being a predominantly Islamic nation and being one of the founder of the OIC or the Organization for Islamic Cooperation it actually brought China close to the Islamic world and it also played a very very important role in bringing China and USA together in the 1972 so that time it was very important do you guys remember what was happening at that point of time the vietnam war was going on so why because why see usa is a capitalist country why would it really want to go and shake hands with a communist country so the vietnam war was going on right in the northern vietnam the aid was being supplied by soviet union a communist country and the southern vietnam it was controlled by usa now usa was actually losing the war and at that point of time it was president richard nixon now you'll be amazed to know richard nixon was never in support of the communist but once he came into power he realized that we lose the war in vietnam if we really don't do something about soviet union so then he decided that let's meet china what will happen is china is not china at that point of time was not a very important world player but it was a huge country and it was a communist country so when america would go to china russia will take notice and russia will fear because see you are trying to court somebody else's girlfriend russia and china were girlfriend boyfriends so if somebody else someone else comes a stranger comes in they are trying to court your girlfriend so definitely you'll fear it so russia will get interested and russia will get in somewhat in pressure now why did they did want to get russia and china in pressure because russia and china were the people who were helping north vietnam fight the vietnam war against usa so uh, if we are able to distract russia because of china then they might not really help out hanoi or vietnam in its liberation war 
so that was the whole idea of this historic visit pakistan enabled this historic visit because previous to 1970s usa and china had no diplomatic relations they were not on talking terms so this time it was this uh, henry kissinger he went to pakistan he discussed it with the um, the pakistani people they arranged for the visit and president richard nixon visited and he was there for entire week in china and that's when china and usa finally established diplomatic relations properly that's what sami that's the funny part in fact a lot of people blame nehru for that and blame indira gandhi for that that when we were signing the simla accord when we had that power when we could actually put them under our thumb why did we not take that back why why we never took that back so that's a question that everybody raises that's a question and uh, we should have done that yes an opportunity lost unfortunately okay china pakistan also have a free trade agreement so china does not have a free trade agreement with us but they have it with pakistan it was signed in 2007 matlab it is in power since 2007 and it has now been again revised so there is a part 2 of the china pakistan free trade agreement revised in january 2020 gwadar port everybody knows i will show it to you on map defense ties they are jointly developing jf 17 fighter which is equal into the f 16 fighter of the usa army there is a china pakistan economic corridor which i'll discuss in detail so i'll leave it for now also the infrastructure investment so the recent one i'm not covering the uh, uh, all of them because there are lots of them that china is investing so one is china pakistan e economic corridor there are other lots of things that pa china is investing so this was recently news because it happened on 22nd may 2020 so the daimar bhasha dam is actually in the pok or the park occupied territory the project has recently been given to china and the frontier worker organization of pakistan all right it is a dam on the indus river so that's why india is so um, breathing in and out and india is getting so restless also there is a huge international support that china gives to pakistan whether it be the shanghai cooperation organization do you guys remember i had discussed the shanghai cooperation organization when i was discussing the neighborhood so india got entry because of russia because china was trying to take over the entire shanghai cooperation organization by take over i mean it was trying to woo all the central asian nations so china to counter russia's support of india also got pakistan entry into it and that's why both india and pakistan became members of sco or the shanghai cooperation organization on the kashmir issue also china supports pakistan on the non proliferation treaty also china supports pakistan and the nuclear and space technologies for everyone to see nuclear no direct mention is there because obviously pakistan couldn't be supported in a nuclear way as per the mtcr regime which china says it follows but it covertly it is for everyone to see that pakistan couldn't have de developed the technology on its own and the special te uh, space technology support so we'll discuss it a little bit more in detail okay any doubts so far anything at all folks are we good to go okay <coughs> look at the trade that happen so this is a, a thing that i've been showing you for quite some time to check the trade that china does with our neighbors so china pakistan trade is close to 20 billion dollars as of 2018 and india pakistan trade is approximately 3 billion dollars see the amount of difference almost six times the trade with our uh, neighbor and who is not even an immediate neighbor of china so are you understanding the level of ties that pakistan and china have so it will be very difficult for india to actually break this nexus we either have to be with them or we have to have the economic heft that pakistan leaves china and com comes back running to india either ways it has to happen okay what about the pakistan india trade so these are the recent data which happened after pakistan cut the bilateral ties what do we export to pakistan cotton organic chemicals plastics paints and dyes machines and parts and what do we import mineral fuel and oils fruits and nuts in a big manner salt sulfur lime ores or slags and ash or mineral content and leather products now as you can see in the trade ways india has a positive balance of trade with 
Pakistan. The combined trade is somewhere uh, uh, 3 billion dollars as you can see if you add both these. This is the export number and this is the import number which has after the sanctions reduced only to 500 million dollars. And now it will be completely over because we are not having any trade now. So Pakistan, the imports are very, very less. The exports are very high from India. So ideally, it's Pakistan which is bearing the brunt of not doing trade with India. Let's come to Daimar Bhasha Dam, as I just told you. So it is located here. The GB here stands for Gilgit Balistan, which is a disputed territory. All right. KPK here stands for Khyber Pakhtunwa, which is the province of Imran Khan. And AJK stands for Azad Kashmir. So this dam is actually at the boundary of uh, Khyber Pakhtunwa and the uh, Gilgit Balistan. This is the Daimar Bhasha Dam. It is on the Indus River. And this area is completely disputed. So that's why India has high stakes in it. Let's come to the space technology part. Are we good to go? Everybody, anything that you have to say? Any comments? No comments as of now? Everything hunky-dory? Chalo, theek hai. Okay, let's move. So, actually, this is space and upper atmosphere research commission all right space and upper atmosphere research commission just like isro it is the space body or space governmental organization of pakistan and you'll be amazed to know it was set up in 1961 almost eight years before isro isro was set up in 1969 so chinese ministry of aerospace industry and suparco had an agreement back in 1991 on space cooperation. In fact, in 2005, China started a special Asia-Pacific Space Cooperation Program. Okay, great, Sami. Asia-Pacific Space Cooperation Program, which included countries Bangladesh, Iran, Mongolia, Pakistan, Peru, Thailand, Turkey. Don't need to remember the names. But look at the cooperation. So they started the Asia-Pacific Cooperation to help people in their space programs. And as of now, in 2011, China not only helped Pakistan, but also helped it make its first satellite, which was launched by the China. Then, going ahead, the two countries signed a very, very long roadmap for space cooperation, 2012 to 2020. However, nothing much happened during that duration. It is only now that that agreement, they have uh, agreed to actually extend till 2040. Now, what is the Space Silk Route or Belt Road Initiative? So, the Belt Road Initiative, you guys already know. And obviously, Pakistan is a party to uh, China in the Belt Road Initiative. Guys, apologies. It should never here be India-Pakistan relations. It should always be China-Pakistan relations. I'm extremely sorry. This mistake shouldn't have happened. When we talk about Space Silk Route, it means China says that we will have three-tire connectivity in Pakistan, land, air, and water. And we'll cover the entire 3D space. That's why the Space Silk Route, that is the name it has given to the BRI initiative in Pakistan. The another initiative in space dimension that China and Pakistan are cooperating on is Pakistan will be sending a Pakistani astronaut through Chinese spacecraft. So they can't make it on their own. So definitely they'll use China, just like we used to use Soviet Russia. Now. Last is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. So this is a project which was started back in 2013. All right. And as of now, the cost of the project is somewhere $65 billion. So it's a huge project. And China is doing huge infrastructure work again in the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor thing. So what is it actually doing? It is linking the seaport of Gwadar with Karachi. Yes, so these both are ports. Karachi is also a big financial capital. Gwadar is also a very deep sea port of maintained by China. So China has not only developed it, it will also link these two ports, right? So it will link Gwadar and Karachi. Then 
it will also build a road from karachi to peshawar and from karachi to lahore this is another one then there will be another road from gwadar going on till khudarza in pakistan's bilkul uh, top end or the northern end so this entire corridor in the red and green that you see which i am outlining right now will be under this china pakistan economic corridor it will also make a railway line between peshawar and lahore it will reconstruct the entire railway line so there will be railway lines which will be built there will be motorways which will be built there will be connectivity between the sea ports yes and this connectivity will further be taken into kashgar in china so that they can link china and pakistan through pakistan occupied kashmir so india has a benefit also that if india would have participated in the bri then india would have could have actually developed its infrastructure in those regions however the strategically it's not a very wise decision why because pok is a disputed territory so if you allow or if you are a part of letting china and pakistan build something there that means you acquiesce to the fact that yes it is not a disputed territory anymore and you can do whatever you feel like doing so that is what they are trying to do here let's come to the next one so <coughs> what are the other things that it is doing as a part of china pakistan economic corridor apart from building roads and bridges and railway lines or motorways or highways it is also building power plants and fiber network optics so energy almost 33 billion dollars are being invested in building hydro power plants yes so hydro power and coal power plants so the blue ones here are hydro power plants the black one here are the coal powered plants yes and the green one here is are the wind uh, wind farms that they are trying to build and the yellow one here are the solar farms that china is trying to make into pakistan all right let's move on so these two pipelines this is the last 10 minutes of our discussion last uh, 15 minutes of our discussion i'll discuss both the ipi and the tapi gas pipeline which the people had been talking about for some time now and then we'll discuss the way forward with samir and shri hari and a lot of other people have been asking yes so we'll conclude with that now let's come here so the india pakistan uh, uh, iran pakistan india pipeline was actually conceived in 1995 it's a very very old thing and it is approximately 3000 kilometers long now the problem is that originally the pakistan the pipeline was supposed to be only between india and uh, iran 1000 kilometer approximately 1800 kilometer pipeline so it's from turkmenistan goes to afghanistan pakistan and india i will show both your, both of these pipelines to you on map first so that you understand more okay uh guys is the video hang up or is it coming proper okay i think it's better now great so look at the pipelines here the tapi pipeline sorry the tapi pipeline starts here in turkmenistan this is dolatabad gas field yes they start from here goes through kandhar herat highway do you remember kandhar this kandhar and herat kandhar is the place where that plane was uh, hijacked and then we had to release the terrorist and lal krishna advani actually took those terrorist so the dolatabad to herat to kandhar ketta in pakistan multan in pakistan to fazilka in punjab in india that's the tapi pipeline for you it's a relatively smaller one because you can see the length turkmenistan is closer to us then the iran pakistan india pipeline it's from saluye the gas fields are here and near bandar abbas so from here to here then to iran sheher then to khuzdar in pakistan also linking to karachi sui and then multan so for both the points turkmenistan or uh, sorry tapi or ipi the common point is multan and from multan one the tapi goes to fazilka and the other one goes to new delhi the ipi pipeline goes to new delhi however ipi is in limbo tapi is still going ahead so let's study more about it so 
the work on tapi so why did tapi actually come about tapi actually came about because after soviet union disintegrated what do central asian countries have they have gas and oil to sell so but all the pipelines they had were controlled by russia and russia was not letting them use it so they decided to go ahead making a new pipeline and pakistan being their closest neighbor who had a great need for oil and gas they decided that they will take the pipeline through afghanistan and then to pakistan so both afghanistan and pakistan needed that oil and gas so they accomplished and then india chipped in so the construction of the project started in turkmenistan in 2015 and was completed by 2019 so they completed the entire thing by 4 years afghanistan side also started and uh, uh, now they are almost uh, going towards completion and pakistan will be uh, has already started in october 2019 and they should be completing they should have completed in 2020 but given the corona virus situation nobody knows how it pans out additionally you must be thinking that if it is pa passing through afghanistan then how are they tackling taliban which is still there so us actually came and came on board because of this because us also wanted a share of this uh, gas and all and it wanted its companies to be there it wanted that the contract of actually making this pipeline should go to a company of usa so it was there it talked to pakistan it talked to taliban both afghanistan pakistan usa they all went talked to taliban so taliban agreed that they will cooperate for the project and they will not let any disruptions happen during the project so as of now the current status is tapi is on ipi is off or off the table right now okay great so way forward now as everybody has been talking so far the first thing is see uh we unilaterally actually cannot do anything so we have tried doing that enough so the only thing first has to happen is that pakistan has to realize that neighborhood is very very important the second thing that has to happen is obviously culture of soft diplomacy alone will not work with that stubborn neighbor it's like i'll tell you something it's like that stubborn younger, younger sibling that you have for example my sister so i to get things done from her she is very dear to me she's extremely dear to me most of the time i take the initiative to give her things to be on her good books but there are times when i have to tackle her i use both my soft and hard power so there are times when i talk to her nicely but if she doesn't respond well i have to teach her place teach her that where her place lies and tell her that it is completely not acceptable and that i will stop engaging and that's when she starts to relent a little bit and then i can really get something moving on so we have to do a similar thing with pakistan all right and there uh, here pakistan has its parents in form of china here my parents are there as a form of china so they keep influencing my sister but then i have to be strong enough to actually sway the entire decision in my direction right so coming here we have to have the higher powers on our side that's what i do i take my parents on my side sometimes to actually get things done by my sister or i tell her what something is not acceptable so we have to do something similar with pakistan it's both actually varun it's it's both because see it has nothing to lose we have a lot to lose and we have lost a lot they have lost a lot but there is no accountability it's only now that they are having democracy properly so now there is some accountability right okay the second thing that we are going to do when it comes to both soft and hard diplomacy have the international organizations on our side that's the best way to do it in fact the financial action task force first blacklisting pakistan and then grey listing it was a big measure because then you don't get finances easily it really hits you in the stomach so it is often said a person can take a kick in the back but cannot take a kick in the stomach you cannot uh, obliterate uh, uh, obliterate their food security you can uh, kick them in the back you can punish them you can beat them up but you cannot kick them in their stomach so when uh, the FAT, fatf grey list thing happened that actually led to their economy weakening so uh, so that they actually requested they were in the black list earlier that they were giving no financial transactions were allowed or they were completely under scanner but then they were moved to grey list after pakistan decided that it will go ahead with the fatf it will support the fatf in finding out the areas of terrorist financing second thing because of our incessant askings of the world we finally managed to get masood azhar a renowned terrorist 
the designation of a global terrorist so that all the funding is stopped to his organizations so these kind of things actually bring out a lot of international pressure or a spotlight on pakistan the other way going forward is to actually uh, take forward the ufa agreement so when was ufa agreement signed it was signed in 2015 in russia along the brics summit along the sidelines of the brics summit there we decided to actually combat terrorism together free the fishermen on either side let the military people meet more often like it happens with china and we encourage religious to- uh, tourism like we did in kartarpur sahib that will bring in new dimensions of the diplomatic engagements next we also have to go to the bigger powers usa australia and somehow we have to engage with china also in fact we moved further on that so during one of the uh, brics meetings china actually agreed with india that they should fight terrorism together because it's hurting everybody but then china keeps uh, falling back so we'll have to have more friends who can um, uh, change the balance or tilt the balance towards india rather than tilting the balance towards pakistan and china usa you can rely only on a bit because see usa has a lot of vested interest in pakistan so it is india's duty to make usa realize that if you weaken india here you will perpetually lose out to china so the only way to control china is not to support pakistan in its designs support india make india stronger because we are the only country that can stand or that can carry your word against china in the entire asia pacific right we are the only country which is that huge in size or which has that kind of population other than that as people have mentioned here cricket and cultural diplomacy we are already doing that and water diplomacy so why am i talking about water diplomacy like with nepal and bhutan they uh, nepal exports hydroelectric power to us and uh, uh, bhutan to uh, bhutan uh, sorry bhutan also exports uh, hydropower to us and bangladesh to bangladesh we export hydropower so that way is we become interdependent trade wise energy wise so maybe we can take our water dispute further in fact uh, kal the dispute we actually take the cooperation there that okay we are building dams so instead of you asking china to build the dams let, let us help you make the dams we are doing it for other neighbors we can do it for you too and that means we can have sharing of electricity pakistan is a completely energy starved nation so it will get a lot of help from the expertise of india and we are closer neighbors china takes a while to actually get to pakistan but india is very very close we have so many border crossings kartarpur now being again a second one there so that will really help with that it's the end of my session today i hope it was uh, informative for all you guys yes uh, folks i hope things actually look like this uh in our coming times so this is here and i would also like to show you something very interesting the first cartoons that we actually used this is here here so this is what india park dosti looks like they want to do a lot of things but they are actually not able to do it uh, can you see here the people are at a very very low height then the tree everything is there but we can't reach the tree then why can't we take the relationship forward because the distrust the ceasefire violations the killings the military militancy years of mistrust is extremely high and both of them are seeing it be it imran khan be it Man, uh, modi both of them are seeing it coming here this is how the kashmir issue actually looks like kashmir is suffering because india and pakistan are fighting it's the people of kashmir who are suffering so with that folks i'll uh, close for today all right so let's go back i will share my telegram link with you guys there it goes this is my group link this is my challenge link at both the places i share all my upcoming videos and uh, both on an academy and on youtube additionally if you like our sessions if you like an academy if you enroll for any course in an academy under the upsc csc category please use my code sbus <coughs> sorry varun you're welcome salman you're welcome i hope it was enjoyable for everybody else please use my code sbus 
for any subscription under the UPSC CSC category, you will get an instant 10% discount. The fee structure I've already shared with you. Also, if you like the video, please subscribe to our channel, hit the bell icon for more notifications and hit the like button. So with that, I'll close for today. I hope, uh, is uh, are we good to go, everybody? Sorry. Uh, Sivranjini, the next prelim class is on uh, 26th. So it's alternate day class, 26th July, 10 a.m. in the morning. Rishabh, there is no PDF as I've already told. I will uh, give out the PDFs once the Asia edition is completed. All right? Or you can ping me. Good to go, everybody. Good night then. Uh, Varun, I think uh, the next class is on 28th. You will get the notification on the Telegram group. I think you're already there on the Telegram group. So I will post the link there. So you will have full idea of that. But my class usually happens at 8.30 p.m. in the evening. Both the class, the academy class and this class. Only the prelims test series happens in the morning at 10 a.m. All right? Okay, folks. With that, I'll close for today. Good night.